Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I am continuing my series of webinars. We are now up to this is 305. It has actually been three years since I started doing these because I started them in March during uh, when we went into COVID lockdown. And I have to say that you guys have been awesome in terms of giving me feedback and how much you're enjoying them. Just remember that you can find the audio on the on Wendy's Winnie's. The podcast is called Wendy's Winnie's. It's on iTunes, Google. You can subscribe to that. And we post two audios a week from the webinars and we're only up to like 190. So we've got a lot. We're still trying to catch up. Um, so just go out to Wendy's Winnie's and subscribe. And of course, subscribe to the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Today, my guest is Dr. Rachel Bellini, a dear friend and um, very bright person. And I'm so glad to bring her back. This is your third webinar, right? I think so. You right, but I was wondering first. I was wondering what the date was because it would have been March 2020, right? So I was actually yeah, wondering, can, what, the, I was I wondering what the exact date was, how, how, how close we were to the exact three-year mark. Really close. So I'll look that up. Why don't you give everybody a little intro about your background while I do that? And so, um, so uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am a 1991 graduate. That puts me in my 32nd year of veterinary practice. So I've had a lot of experience. Um, I have pretty much done equine sports medicine my entire career. And um Sort of the last 20 years, I started to integrate and have spent um, a lot of time learning about, um, you know, lots of different modalities, acupuncture, chiropractic, homeopathy, you know, lots of different things. But what really has, um, you know, sort of stolen my heart has been the advanced chiropractic courses that kind of come into functional neurology and involve the brain and, um, you know, start to kind of look at the whole horse and a big, a big, you know, a big pivoting point in my, um, my career was when I took the courses with Dr. Karen Gelman and Dr. Judith Shoemaker and learned about postural rehabilitation. And that was kind of, has sort of been the foundation of my um, focus from there is, is looking at, looking at posture, and and learning and learning from the posture and rehabilitating the posture and you know because the posture is the emerging property of everything that's going on um, it's it's a really it's a really great way to it's a really great place to work and um, it's a lot easier because they're not moving all over the place all the time so you can <laughs> you can actually see what's happening it's like um, you know, if you can learn learn to see from that still shot right. Um, that's great. And that's, that's kind of was sort of the, you know, where I started with Karen and Judith and also um, Elizabeth Reese, who's an Alexander teacher. And then it's been this sort of this cascade that kind of all layering upon that. And um, then at Thanksgiving, Wendy happened to be in the, in the state. So she joined me and we had this really, you know, pivotal um, experience with her where her doing the Feldenkrais work, work on me, and I was just able to really, um, really feel how she was, you know, she was moving me into the places rather than putting me there. It was like, a, it was like a guiding and it was, there was a lot of mobility going on to it. And after she would guide me, she would move me. And so it was like putting me someplace and integrating me and putting me someplace and integrating me. That was, that was sort of my experience. And it was mind blowing, like mind blowing and and there was trauma release and and there was i mean it was just it was mind blowing i can't even i can't even really go there so anyway i started really thinking about moving and the past and moving in the past and moving in the past and that's what we're going to talk about today so without so, further so, ado um it it what i what i saw was after you had a feldenkrais lesson you understood surefoot at a, at a personal deep level which then took you back to saying, well, how, how is this working with the horses? And I, you know, it, it's so hard sometimes for me to realize, I mean, I know I tell people Feldenkrais is behind Surefoot, that the whole philosophy and the concept and everything. Um, but it's fascinating, it was fascinating to work with you because you knew about Surefoot, you were supported and you're so great working with horses and really helping them find that mobility in themselves. But it just was like that kind of brought it to a whole nother level of understanding and um, 
and that was kind of what ignited this whole other other idea. Um, somebody's asking the name of the practitioners you just mentioned, the ones that you've worked with. So if you can just um, Judith, Dr. Judith Shoemaker, um, she has a practice in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, it's um, called, I think, Always Helpful Veterinary Services. Eh, I hope something like that. Um, and Dr. Karen Gelman, who um, you know, you can find her. She's done some webinars with Yogi Sharp. Um, you know, she's kind of all over some of the ECVM stuff. She's a, she's a postural expert. She's got, um, lots of great degrees and, um, brilliant woman. And she's actually doing a, um, doing some programs with us as well. So we see a lot of Karen too. Uh, she's actually working on a cancer program for dogs. So, um, anybody that's interested in that, another, another reason number 200 to check out Karen Gelman. <laughs> Yep. And so, um, so today we're going to talk about posture, right, Rachel? Yes. Well, actually today we're going to talk about, um, how we can use the Surefoot pads to change how, how a foot pad session can help you to help your horse shift his posture. Right. So, you know, um, basically it's, it's about, um, you know, my, my big thing is clinical. I want people to do, do stuff, not just listen. Um, so, um, if, you know, we're going to go over the walking exercise and just kind of talk about why, why we're walking, why we're not swaying and how we can make changes in our horses, um, really quickly with the surefoot pads in their posture. And if we're doing other stuff, like, um, you know, other kinds of therapy on them or they're in rehab, um, this is just, like a piece of the puzzle that you are missing out if you are not incorporating into and, your and so Rachel, you know, one good. of the things I love about you as a veterinarian is you really want to involve the owner in the horse's process of rehab or prehab, you know, and I, you know, I've started talking more and more about prehab of preventing injuries and recognizing that. And so, you know, I really value the fact that, that what you want to do is empower the owners to be able to help their horses and make wise choices. And so uh, it seems to me like um, your experience with Surefoot is that you've discovered this is another modality that owners can really embrace to be able to help make those changes in the horses. Yeah, I mean, I, I have been, you know, I, I, I pray for an easier way because it's hard for um, it's hard for owners to, you know, stretch horses and, and to pick up their legs. A lot of people don't have the strength and no, the mobility to do that. It's, it's, it's hard. Some of the manual exercises are not easy for every, every human to do with a horse, nor is it easy to do with some of the horses. And, you know, we've got to find easy ways for people to interact with them frequently over time to make a difference. You know, these, these interventions, you know, even as a veterinarian, you know, my, even, even my monthly or my bi, you know, my eight weeks or, you know, my annual maintenance on your horse, whatever it is that I'm doing, it's never going to be enough. It's never going to be enough to keep these, you know, these horses where they need to be. It's gotta, it's gotta be. And unfortunately there's not enough of sort of body work incorporated into training. And right, so, and I know you're working on a program to help owners be able to, to be more advocates for their horses and to be able to recognize what is going to be useful to make an improvement in their horse. Is that right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And and that's you know, and that and that's the thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna teach them how to look at their horses and you're gonna teach them how to ride them. So uh, <laughs> we're gonna, right, I, I, mean, I mean, I mean really like you know, it, it's a it's a big problem. And and as a veterinarian, you, you know, we don't know until we know what kind of wall we're up against if the daily training and the daily riding and the daily tack and the overall musculoskeletal condition of the horse is not conducive to you know the, the desires of its owners. And a lot of times there's, there's a big gap between the awareness of these two things. So the owner thinks everything's great, the trainer's micromanaging behind their backs mm. and they don't, you know, the, the horse is suffering because of that. And so. If yeah, well, we've kind of seen a bigger and bigger gap there between the owner rider, especially when they're in a barn with a trainer, the owner owner who rides and the trainer. And that's like, there's a lot of management happening over here. So the owner can have a good ride, but there isn't a lot of um, 
interaction where the owner is empowered to be able to do things for the horse to keep it so that everybody's happy and the horse is happy and it can keep improving. You know, there's just, there's just so, there's so many variables in this sport. And I think that there's also a lot of different types of people. I mean, there's types of people that want to be really involved and are, are blocked from doing it because of the situation they're in. There's other people that really don't want to be involved and they just want someone, you know, to hand it over to someone yeah. else. And, but, you know, but then sometimes a horse suffers for that if they're not in the right program. And so the more people, you know, Sue Dyson's, I mean, the ethogram, I mean, the more awareness we have that this means a horse is unhappy and the more, you know, the, that, that language is globally across the industry that, you know, every single person, you know, that sees a horse, you know, going behind the vertical and like this is like, wow, that's terrible. You know, that would be like, you know, watching someone light up a cigarette in the middle of a restaurant these days. Right. I mean, that I mean, that's the way you want people to start to see these problems where it's just so offensive to the eye because they are so conditioned to know what beautiful and normal and grace and ease and all these things that we really want. Like they know what that, you know, they know right. that that's attainable. Well, and that's the thing is you get so accustomed to looking at something. My, my case in point is that when I went to Hawaii and we did a clinic there with a friend of mine and I were teaching and all these horses came in and their coats were really rough. And we looked at their coats and went, wow, they're all really rough. And then one horse came in with a shiny coat and we're like, wow, what are you doing? She says, I line my fields because it's all volcanic. But the other people didn't notice that the coat was rough because all the horses looked that way. And yeah. I think that that's what you're talking about now is that we've got to get to the place where we can recognize that there's something missing so that we can start educating our eye and then exactly. we can actually do something about it. Yes, that's 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 number that's number one. That's number all right. one. So that said, <laughs> right. let's dive right so, in here. Well, I gotta make a hang on, I gotta make a co host. Share my screen. Oh, yep. you've disabled I, my screen. Wait, sharing. I just no, I just enabled your screen actually. Okay. You were disabled. All right, let's share. And let's do that. Let's do. All right. Walk, don't sway. So uh, y'all could read that. That's kind of, uh, was a little bit of the impetus for this talk was that um, I had gone to a, a meeting and um, my teachers were really, really uh, not happy with the swaying horses. And so we had a lot of talks about that and about the cerebellum. And so then I met Wendy and we did the walking. And so anyway, I think walking is better than swaying and we will do we this. Do we know yet what the swaying is or are you gonna talk, talk about that? Well, so so basically, you know, the, the, the brain on sure foot, right? So sensory receptors in the foot are gonna pick up the information if the surface is unstable. So the horse is on an unstable surface. Oh, oh, I'm on an unstable surface. That information is gonna to go to the brain. It's gonna to go to the brainstem reticular formation, which is, here, this is the brain stem, this is the cerebellum. And then that, you know, the brain stem then goes to the cerebellum. So everything, all the sensory information is gonna come into the brain stem, it's gonna get integrated, that's gonna go to the cerebellum. Cerebellum is gonna talk to the cortex, the cortex is gonna talk to the body. And, you know, there'll be some back and forth that maybe doesn't go up to the frontal cortex, but the cerebellum has a, has a really good relationship with the frontal cortex. And so, the reticular formation uh, will mediate complex reflexes and functions like posture, and it receives projections from all sensory modalities. So this is where that, you know, you know, what we're getting is, is whoa, I'm on an unstable surface. Help, help, right? That's what the, that's what the, you know, the brainstem is getting. So then the brainstem is like, okay, okay, we gotta, you know, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do, right? And what what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to stabilize. You know, if we're on an unstable surface, we're supposed to stabilize because if we get too unstable you know, we're, we're going to fall down and that is, that's not what we want. So, you know, but the problem is, is that once you start swaying, you're no longer stabilizing. Now you're swaying. Okay. So that means that you can't stabilize. Otherwise you probably would. Cause that's what you're supposed to do when you're on an unstable surface is, you know, you're supposed to get stable. Unstable isn't, isn't where we want to be. We want to be stable. So when you have a horse that starts swaying, there can be a couple of different things going on. And we're going to get to that in the next slide. But I, I really want to 
you know, what this slide really wants to say is that, show you is that once the information goes to the cerebellum, there are 20 million fibers between the cerebellum and the cortex, 20 million. There are only 1 million fibers from the cortex to our skeletal muscles to tell them what to do, all right? Oh. So there's like 20 times in the millions you know, need for information about where we are, what we you know, all that, all that interaction information between, you know, the sensory information coming in, the integration of that sensory information, and then that going to the cortex of our brain to have, you know, to do shit, right? So um, that's really important. So, you know, that, that's, that's a lot of information. And so basically the point being is that Every time we have sensory information coming in, we are firing up that stuff. You know, we are firing it up. We are like going to front of the cortex. We are doing stuff, but you, you don't want to overdo it. And swaying could be an indication that you are getting to that point where you are overdoing it. So you need to be careful. And if, you know, I think, I think the next slide talks about... Well, I'm uh, so glad you're so talking about this because I, but... I keep trying to tell people to keep the session short. And, you know, and then people say, oh, I let my horse stand on pads for five minutes. And I'm like, five minutes is forever. Um, and so I'm just really glad you're talking about this because that's been a concern of mine that people don't understand what what I'm, what I mean. So this is fabulous. I'm thrilled. I think, I think you have to take, you know, every... Everything, you know, there are no hard and fast rules. I mean, you know, some swaying is going to stimulate the need for those postural muscles, right? But but not too much, right? So, you know, for me, like my, you know, my way is like once the horse started to sway, I might let it sway a little bit and then I would take it off. Now, if it was the front feet and, you know, I had a sore footed horse with laminitis or something and it wanted to stand on the pads for an hour, I might... Like, you know, I mean, you know, again, depending, right? If you, if a sore footed horse, it might just provide it relief. And if the ground's really hard, you know, that's a whole different story when I'm standing on it. But I don't think them swaying and being really, you know, out of it is a good thing. Um, but the main thing with sensory information is that you are, you are firing up this stuff. And so if you've got nothing coming in, you're not processing anything. And so you know it's it's a little bit of you know it's great to have you want the good stuff coming in you don't want you know you want them you want stuff coming in that's going to make them fire up those postural muscles and, and and use the stuff that we want them to you know for their for their athletic performance so we're back to all the right line. so <laughs> this is just a video of swaying for any of you that have never seen it um this is he's on two of the soft pads behind and you can see like how he's not really um protecting himself like he's not really correcting himself very much and he's just sort of going into a little bit of a you know a dysfunctional situation there maybe a little bit a little bit there now that it stopped but in, in general you know and they'll do it a lot more that was just kind of the the, the first video I could find that can you that just had, replay that, had that it. so we can watch it again yeah yeah because it always plays better the second time on zoom And you can see that he definitely sways more to the right than to the left, and and the way that foot's weight bearing. Exactly, and you can see how how braced he is on that right hind, just kind of digging that foot in, right? And so you know he's probably got more, more you know, a little more stability on that. I mean, on that left hind than he does on the right hind. Yes. Right. So you can see which leg is unstable. So again, you can get some information from this stuff. Absolutely. Um, all right, so swaying can be an indication that the cerebellum is overloaded or not as healthy as it should be. It can be very hard to tell if this is why the horse is swaying. If this is, you are going to push the cerebellum further into dysfunction, a condition known as cerebellar decompensation, meaning it can no longer compensate and correct the imbalance. Any horse that has any health disease allowing them to sway would not help them heal and may create more problems. But sometimes is it okay to sway? <laughs> a little mindful swaying if you're watching the horse can help to stimulate the postural muscles and offer a challenge. If you know your horse's cerebellum is healthy and they seem to be doing a lot of internal work 
through this way, I will watch and maybe cut these sessions short and add a walk. Overall, I don't feel a lot of swaying is creating the neural pathways in the brain that we want. It's not activating the cerebellum, which is what we want. We want that cerebellum working. So that's well, and, about swaying. This, this is great. And this, you know, the, the neurologic part is, um, it's really important. Like I, anybody that ever asked me, you're going to use sure foot neurologic. It's, I just want to always tell them, get a diagnosis because there's so many different types of neurologic problems that it could be helpful or it could be really hurtful. Right. It can be, you know, it can, it can, it can, I mean, again, you, you know, you want to, when you're mucking with the nervous system, you just want to know what you're doing, right? Like you just want to be mindful about it because you don't want plasticity in the wrong areas, you know, you don't want to create more, you know, you don't want to create more uh, space on the pathways that you don't want to be driving on. Right. So, you know, that's, that's where you just like, for me, it's just, it's, it's, it could potentially be harmful in a horse that has a problem. And, but, you know, we can't necessarily, you know, lots of horses maybe don't have great balance. Maybe their cerebellum is a little bit compromised for one reason or another. We don't, we can't, there's no way of really knowing that. Right. Um, so it's a, you know, be careful. All right, Wendy, <laughs> care to give a brief overview of the difference between structural and functional integration and why movement is so important at the somatic level? Oh, wow. That's an awesome question. So, so, um, structural integration, the way I look at it is, um, and let me take you back a little bit. So Dr. Feldenkrais was alive during a period when a woman named Ida Rolf was alive and Ida Rolf created structural integration and Dr. Feldenkrais created functional integration. Now I have had Rolfing sessions. I am not a Rolfer, but basically what they're doing there is making sure that your structure is workable. It's working. It can work. Functional integration is how do you use it? So, you know, I've worked many times with people that had a lot of structural integration and I can give them a functional integration lesson quite easily because the function is, a, the, the movement is available. They're just not sure where to go with it, like how to organize it. That was, that was me. Yes. So you can think about like, if I have all the bones in my arm and they're all moving easily, but I don't know how to take my arm and actually feed myself, then I have this great mobility and I don't know what to do with it. So, um, not that in many cases you can have structural integration and improved function as a result. So my example is after the horse rolled on top of me and I had been in the hospital and about nine months later, I had a dozen structural integration lessons and it took my leg, which was pointing to the about, about 10 o'clock um, and it brought it back to noon. It brought it back to forward. And so, you know, it was really important in my recovery. Um, but like when I'm thinking about for my riding, I need functional integration because I got to know how all this stuff in that my body can do organizes for me to have the communication, the effect on my horse. So they're very related. They're very relatable, but they're slightly different. And Ida Rolf was the creator of st structural integration and Dr. Feldenkrais created functional integration. And the one other thing I'll say about functional integration is that Dr. Feldenkrais was an engineer. He was an, a scientist. And so if you have ever taken calculus, you know, uh, the, the word function is a mathematical term, right? And integration, when you do calculus, is that you do, and I did not do well in calculus, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you differentiate and then you integrate it into a whole. And so there's this whole concept of differentiating, like making sure every joint moves and then integrating that into a function. So that's kind of like a ticky tour of the differences. That, you know, that, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And, and, and so, and so are you. So, um, so, so again, I mean, this is kind of what we're doing here, right? So, you know, you put the, you put the horses on the pads and that gives them a moment to structurally integrate, right? Like they're doing it on their own. They're, they're standing on the pads and they're structurally integrating and then we're moving them and they're functionally integrating functionally integrating it's it's so it's so brilliant i almost can't stand myself sometimes hey really. i do have one question for you before you go to your next slide okay someone's asking so the lines between cerebellar overload and releasing myofascial lines is really knowing your horse slash client question mark um 
Well, cerebellar overload isn't necessarily going to happen through, you know, because what the cerebellum is doing is it's doing, you know, it's stabilizing, it's fine motor movements, it's postural adjustments, all, all of that stuff. So, you know, it, it, it allows me to raise my arm like that and, and instead, you know, instead of in, in, in jerky moments, right? So um, when you're releasing, you know, fascia, certainly you're getting a lot of sensory input into the brainstem, but it isn't necessarily a cerebellar experience, depending on what the horse is doing, I guess would be my answer. So, you know, whenever you're doing body work on horses, you know, no matter what kind of body work you're doing, you're always looking to, you know, you're always um, protecting yourself against overloading, you know, the system in general, you know, not just the cerebellum. So, you know, uh, the, oh, oh, you know, overloading the cerebellar decompensation is sort of different than what they call transneuronal degeneration or transneural or whatever that word is, where you're basically, you know, the horse's pupils get large and they, you know, they're acting like, you know, they can't really function anymore. That's kind of when you've given, you know, you've done too much potty work on the horses and they've gotten, you know, just their brain or I'm not even sure entire system is no longer able to, to process. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I don't, I don't typically worry about the cerebellum when I'm doing, um, myofascial work, like just like a masterson type myofascial work, if that helps. You know, there really is so much we don't know about the horse's brain. I just, um, we, we, you know, I mean, if I had my druthers, okay, in my perfect, perfect world with money not being an expense, I would want to know what's happening in the brain while horses are having body work and, and on pads, right? Like, could we like mind map their brain and see what, what's lighting up? Well, I mean, you know, I, I feel like enough of that's been done in the human field that if, you know, I was a little bit less lazy, we could probably do some research. Um, I mean, you know, to me, like, I don't I don't think it's that mysterious, honestly, because, you know, having having the, you know, having a system, a mammalian system on an unstable surface is something there's been a lot of research on. Right. But but I do think what you don't know, what you don't know is, is that when you fire up the brain in a certain way, you know, you don't actually know how much it's going to have an effect on other parts of the brains and other things. And so that's where I think there's a real individual kind of response to it. But I also feel like if we are able, you know, if our evaluation is good, you know, we can, you know, we can evaluate that. We can see that ourselves. So I am going to show you the video of my walking exercise. It's in time lapse. So we'll only take a minute. Uh, this is the exercise. This is the full physio pad because uh, no, Natasha that's a hard has, pad. has my, oh, that's a full, that's a hard pad because a friend has a half physio pad, but basically all, all this exercise is, is one foot, one pad, take a walk and I'll play it again. Yeah, because um, because even in that, you could see the breathing change in the horse. It was really cool. Oh, oh you can see so, you know, like, yeah, when you do it, like Mary Ellen, um, Mary Elena uh, on my Facebook page, she did a really beautiful YouTube video of this exercise where, um, just beautiful, where um, they, they uh, it's, it's slow and, and she does a beautiful job with great technique and, um, and so on. So, so anyway, this is um, the hard pad, but it's the same density as the half physio, right? Yeah, the half is yours at an inch and with a half inch of medium. This right, is right. But it, but it's the same pad right. inside. Right. So 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 anyway, I um and I'm just gonna, you know, for those of you that are gonna tell me, well, you know, I don't have any place to walk. I I was doing this exercise in the aisle the other day uh, of a barn. Um some of my hunter jumper horses, if I if I walk them in the uh in the ring, they think they're going to lunge and they, they start rearing as soon as they go in if they're on a lead chain. So I, uh, and, and they were busy in there. So I, I walked horses all day in the aisle. You know, I started each one of my, uh, my body work sessions um, just by doing this exercise, uh, just simply, you know, up and up and down the aisle. Here he is, he's, 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 so, he's, so, he's so mesmerized that he doesn't even realize that there's a horse there eating hay, right? Um, so I think that, I thought that was like super cool. He's like, just, just chilling, just chilling here. 
in the in the in the in the aisle. Yeah, is the video on the right? On the like like the first time you did it in the video, what's the difference between the two videos besides one being? From oh, the just just like I would walk them down, and I was just I was just getting like different views with my camera, you know. But I was just kind of showing on the on the left. The right one was to show you that you can walk horses in the aisle of the Donner Barn and still have an effect. You're still integrating, even if you can't. You know, you don't have an arena, or it's like some. You know, there's no place to walk them. You can. You can just walk them in the barn. Um, it's fine. It's still it's still effective. And and so this guy it was just I was just kind of wanting to show how, you know, he was really enjoying like the pad, right? He's 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 so kind of integrating in his body with this that he he's well, and he's really even... let his neck go, right? Right, right. Well, so here, so uh, here's this is him, right? So um, basically. Uh, the activation of the cerebellum caused by the information coming from the feet will fire up the frontal cortex. This will cause inhibition to the sympathetic flight or fight part of the nervous system by way of inhibition of the intermediate lateral cell column, which will then take the inhibition off the parasympathetic nervous system, creating a horse that is in the parasympathetic state ready to train and learn. So when you fire up the frontal cortex, that sends, um, information down to the body and most of it is inhibitory um, because that's a lot of what the frontal cortex does is inhibit us that's why say someone with like Tourette syndrome has a lack of frontal cortex inhibition that's you know so um the the more you kind of you know down regulate the the more you fire up the cortex the more it's going to you know slow down and and inhibit the sympathetic nervous system um in a way by basically taking taking the break off the parasympathetic nervous system so the sympathetic nervous system has kind of got when it's firing up it's kind of got a break on our parasympathetic nervous system and so just like agonistic antagonistic muscles you've got to take you know the get you know you've got to take the pressure off you know off the sympathetic nervous system to get the break off the parasympathetic and so that's why these forces can have you know, such a down-regulating um, effect. And, um, you know, walking afterward doesn't just help to integrate it, but it also kind of continues to sort of engage the frontal cortex because now they're doing something, they're going somewhere. And so you're sort of feeding upon this initial thing. And what's really, um, really just so special about this ability of the pads to do this is that, you know, the power of practicing being in the parasympathetic nervous system. And I always tell people that the more you drive on that road, the bigger and wider it gets and the better, you know, the more, the more they want to go on that road. You don't want to drive on a road that's all overgrown. And horses that spend all their time in flight or fight look at that parasympathetic road as like, you know, trying to get to Sleeping Beauty's castle through the storms. And so, you know, we've got to get them practicing this. And so if you did this every day before you rode, if you practiced meditating, breathing, down-regulating, this is almost like a meditation in the sense that that's kind of having the same things on the, on the brain. So, you know, just think, think about how much that can, can help you. And uh, so just this very super quick exercise will get that pathway used more. Well, and that's what I love, Rachel, is that you've come up with because I'm too much in the weeds, right? I live in this place called Sherfoot. And you have taken it and made such a beautiful and simple uh, experience for people to do with their horses that is not going to take a lot of time, but can be so powerful in its effect. And that's, you blew my mind when you came back and you told me, you know, I've been to Colorado and I did this with every horse and it took me 15 seconds and they like changed everyone. And I'm like, wow, why couldn't I have thought of that? But I, obviously I couldn't. <laughs> Because that's why we work together. Right. It, uh, it, you, did, you did think of it, Wendy. You put it all in my brain with your magic hands. Yeah. But but it is that, you know, I've always said, keep it short and 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 walk. And you do get the horses. Somebody's asked the question, what if the horse is stable on the pads and is relaxed, releasing, and wants to stay on them? Should we end the session? Then I'll, then I'll yeah. I mean, if, if they're having a process, you know, if they're going through an experience, yeah. So like this is this is actually kind of short because I started moving the camera too much at the end. But you know, again, this is just one pad. 
I mean, this is like a disconnected pony, right? Like they are kind of like, you know, they're not super always really in their bodies. And, um, you know, look at him. He's just, you know, he's just having an experience. You know, you can see that he's having an experience, right? And, you know, this is just one foot, one pad, you know, and, and so kind of what, what I've been doing with these horses a little bit is that I've been sort of, you know, taking this exercise and, you know, when I have the opportunity, when I have an indoor and it's quiet, and, you know, I have the right horse, like, like this one, for example, um, I take him in and I kind of almost do, you know, half my session in there and I'll, I'll use different pads, right? So like I'll, you know, I'll do the walking exercise and I'll watch, I'll watch, you know, how they respond to each, you know, to each thing. And like this, one thing that this pony was doing was he had the, the thing on his right front, he was like ringing his tail, right? So clearly, you know, the, 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 the coming, pressing up into that nerve plexus in the, in the right front, because that's kind of what you're doing. You know, you're actually, you know, you're actually kind of going into almost a dysfunction, right? And then allowing them to be aware of the dysfunction and then react to it. You know, that's what a lot of my, you know, that's a lot of the like osteopathic work, you know, for me is, is kind of going into the dysfunction and then the body can help you because I sure as hell can't make these horses do anything on by myself. So, so anyway, you know, I just sort of watch them, right? So with this pony, I kind of, I did the walking exercise kind of as is, and then I played around, right? Then I was like, okay, well, I still don't like the way the right hind looks. So I'm going to put a slant pad under that for a minute and take a walk. You know, I'm like, oh, he's still kind of standing funny on that leg. So I'm going to do that one again, take a walk. Oh, you know, his posture is still not perfect there. And so, you know, I eventually like, this was just, this was just doing, just doing the pads, right? Like I hadn't taken a minute and done my body work session on them or anything, right? This was just, just doing the pads, right? But not just the walking exercise. It was kind of a little more, you know, it was almost like a pad body work exercise where I was doing, you know, I was being sort of mindful about it. And, you know, you can see how here he's just basically, you know, he's bracing off the ground and here he's relaxed, you know? The neck, just, the neck is so different. Yeah, you know, well, that's because this muscle, the brachiocephalicus is relaxed, right? So, you know, muscles relax. He's, he doesn't have a lot. I'd like, you know, I like to see a little more lift to his thoracic sling, but like, I'll do that, you know, I'll work on that afterward, but like, he didn't get, he didn't get a ton, but he got a lot of opening, right? So he got a lot of opening here. And so kind of with the thoracic sling work it is, you know, there's kind of a dual component. You can't lift it if it's not open, you know? And that's why it can take so long, you know, for them to strengthen it because if it's just completely compressed and the, the, the lump, you know, the, the vertebrae are all in the jumble and all over the place, it can take a really, you know, it can be, um, you know, you've got to get it opened. And so, you know, when I went back, I, you know, I gave him more, I, was, I sort of activated the lift and maybe I could have done some more walking, but we've got nice length to his back. You know, the hip is, is, is better seated. And that's one of the other things I like with the pads is that you get to hit all four legs. And so, a lot of times um, I see pictures of horses after body work and it looks like they could have used a little more help with their hind ends, a little more integration, a little more input there. And, you know, it can be hard. I mean, the hind end, the muscles are so big. It can be a really hard place to work well. So, well, I'll just stand them on the pad for a minute. Let, it, let them hang there with their toe and take them for a walk instead is, is a lot easier for, for me. So I kind of have just, you know, been using this sort of as a foundation to my beginning. And it allows them to, um, you know, it, it makes them put them more in a parasympathetic state. So the ones that are sort of up, up, or you know, are paying the butt, they they could relax a little bit. Um, and so, can we um, okay, go back so then, for a minute, just go back. I have a couple of questions. Yep. For people. Um, so first of all, um, in at, with those two pictures, all you actually did was the pads. Yeah, I didn't. I wasn't doing body work. Okay. How long was the total session? Maybe, you know, like, I mean, I, I fart around and let them hang out and stuff. So maybe 20, 20, 25 minutes. Okay, great. And did you only do one foot at a time? Yes. And did you only use the hard pad? I used the hard slant. 
So someone and I think I might about, have done. I might it's have done the picture. One. Somebody asked, never sure how and when to use the hard slant. So maybe you can talk about that. So well, I would refer you to my webinar on hey, the hard slant. Hard slant. She has a whole webinar just on that. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy was like, nobody knows how to use the hard slant. Can you do a webinar on the slant? So I did. So yes. Um, there is, a, I think, a great webinar on the hard slants. But um, basically, um, I, I look at the fascial patterns and I kind of see. So like, say, you know, if you look at the medial loading to a foot, like a lot of times you'll pick up a foot and you'll see that the heel on the medial side, the inside, is maybe more blockier or higher, right? There might be a disparity. So clearly, you know, that horse is walking on the outside of its foot. And a lot of horses walk on the outside of their feet, especially behind. Uh, so do a lot of people, including yours truly. And so um, I really get this. And so basically I'll, I'll take the slants and I'll maybe make it high on the outside. So it's easier for them to walk on the outside of their foot, but that will allow more, you know, them to kind of get more into the inside, or I might flip it around to try and do that. You know, I'll play with it, but I'll kind of see. And a lot of horses with negative palmer angles really like to, you know, really like the pan, the pad, the slant backwards where they can kind of dig in and like access that deep flexor tendon and that fascial, that fascial chain because like they're always like, you know, it's it's too long. And so almost you bring it into a little more dysfunction and that allows it to get access a little bit of tensegrity. So, you know, I, I do like all kinds of weird stuff, but really like I'm looking at the horses, I'm looking at the legs that are not what are you laughing about? <laughs> I, I, I do a lot of weird stuff. Well, of course. <laughs> um, but, so, but I'm looking, I'm trying to get the legs in balance. You know, it's, it's like, I, I, I play this game sometimes. I didn't have pictures with it, but I call it like the matchbook game, right? Where the slant pad is like my matchbook and my horse is like my unstable table. So I'm like, okay, you know, which foot should I put this mm -hmm. under to make the table stable, right? And I see if I can stable the table with one slant pad. Um, so anyway, th things to do when you're working by yourself and no one's around. Uh, anyway, um, any other questions you want to hit? Yep, no, so far. But, and the thing Wendy? is, uh, oh, Dina, I'm just going to tell you. on me. Damn it. What? We're not supposed to be freezing. Uh, I'm not freezing. The Are freeze you? was not supposed to happen. It's okay. You'll be back. There you go. All right. Um, yeah, we froze. Play with your slant pads is what I tell you. You know, if you've done flats all the way around, just play with your slants and you'll, you know, so many horses will actually slide that slant around to the way they want it. And yeah. you can get any foot. So um, this was the, the first horse that um, I did. And, and Dr. Janet Varas, who's on with us today, was here with me. And I had kind of a little, kind of a little freak out. You know, I was, um, this horse actually, I don't think it had very, any body work really at all. And um, so I decided to do this little exercise starting out. And what, I'm gonna just take us to the next slide because it's marked up. Um, and this is where I saw my first, you know, where I really thought I was seeing kind of the difference in the thoracic sling and actual lift and engagement of that sling. Um, happen, you know, with just the exercise. And this really was, you know, just one, you know, four circles and, and that's it. And, um, you know, what I'm, what I'm seeing here with just that, that, that really just kind of got me so excited was sort of this area right here, um, just really lengthening, lengthening into the chest. So it's like this, the area between the end of the neck and the front of the leg is like half the size. So your you know? picture on the right is your before and the picture. Yeah, on the, the, uh, this one is the before. So well, that one's the before. Okay. Yeah, this is the before. This is the after. I know it can be it can be hard. It can be hard to tell because sometimes you don't know what's well, the light happen, is different. But, the but light is different. like that's what I'm trying to what I'm what I'm what I'm looking at is like this vascular here. Okay. Whereas this is like almost straight. And here she's got like, it goes up and then she kind of comes down. And that is reflected here. And so this area right here is a lot shorter than that. And we don't, we want this to, to we want, like we want this 
boob here to kind of be up a little more, you know, be back and more in front, you know, not so collapsed. So, so this here is, this is showing actually some lift. And like here, this leg, you can see how the, she's loading, you know, actually a little more into her front end. And she actually has um, a real problem with her stay apparatus. I did a big adjustment on the shoulder afterward. I was able to get a really amazing adjustment and, and get this really right. But here she's not really using her stay apparatus. The leg is in flexion, right? And so she doesn't really have access to that. And that got kind of, she's not using it here either, but you can really see it here, right? That, that the way she's standing and she's bracing a lot more of this leg. So we made, a big shift in here in this area that I was then able, you know, doing my body work, I was able to kind of take sort of to another level where now I was able to get this shoulder aligned. But kind of the other things for me that, that I see a lot that here is that this is a lot softer. This is a little bit steeper. And so she's, you know, through getting this little bit of lift, she's also had a little bit of relaxation through her lower back, allowing her pelvis to drop. So, I mean, these are, you know, again, this is a 10 minute exercise, you know, I mean, this isn't like a 90 minute session of body work on a horse adjusting it and stuff. This is like, you know, a short thing. So um, it's, the changes are subtle, but they're all going in the absolute right direction unbelievably quickly. Like normally it takes me a long time to get this much lift and this much softening because they work sort of together it's like a, it's a function of togetherness right and so they have to sort of relax one for the other to relax and it kind of almost has to happen sort of at the same time in a way for it to work and so the when i saw the way that her back changed and again you know i i get that these changes are not like you know glaringly brilliant but you you can see you know, this is like, like she's got more of a shelf here. You can see a little bit more of a shelf. There's more kind of flattening and, and lengthening tier. She's a little more falling, you know, falling off, falling off a cliff. It's a little more, more of that, you know, which is sort of the next, the first phase, you know, you've got to get them opening and lifting. And then as the core gets strong, you know, then they can kind of come up. So. Um, Anyway, that was that was pretty dramatic for me. I felt like you know these lines were a little bit a little bit straighter. Um, you know, this one was a little bit flatter. Maybe this could come up a little bit. Same here, a little bit, but it's it's hard to it's not you know it's not a, it's not a glaring glaring obvious. But um, I, I did feel like this was this was pretty good, and um, also her pole as well. You can see sort of softening through here. So for a uh, ten minutes. Um, well, and the throw latch is more open too. Right. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, the whole, you know, it's the whole, whole thing here. Yeah, and yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't mention it before, but I, I do want to say that if you have trouble seeing the difference in these things, do not feel uh, less than because it can take a long time to train your eye. A lot of the stuff we're really not used to observing and depending also on the structure of your brain, how much of a visual or verbal thinker you are can, can make it all that much more challenging. So. Um, don't be, you know, don't don't be challenged by not seeing these things if you don't see them. Um, you know, my my goal when I teach this stuff is to give really um, easy, measurable landmarks as well to help you measure things that are different as well if you can't see them. Um, so this is just a quick video I want to show you. Um, this is my horse a couple years ago. Um, on, a, on the surefoot pads. And this is just kind of him sort of working. You know, I just kind of want to show you how much goes on in there, you know, when they have this input, right? So they've got the input coming in from the ground and, and this is them sort of feeding feeding back on it. And I mean, look at the, you know, the tension and the, and the, mus the, the muscular contraction. And I mean, you know, this is not pretty. This horse um, was, is, is finally coming unstuck after three years. But I mean, it had the, the, the stickiest, most compressed uh, area I've ever worked with. And I'll just kind of show that again. 
um, just so you can see him. Mean, he's working his jaw. He's, you know, he can't really access his pecs. He can kind of get down to here. He really can't access anything here, right? When he's moving, you're not really seeing anything else move in the rest of his body with all that neck flexion, right? Just watch that again. That's actually really pretty impressive, well, isn't it? It's, and actually in order for him to move his neck that much, he has to be stiffening somewhere else. You know, I always tell right. people, what's not moving for that thing, whatever it is to move. And you always have to think about it both in those book terms. And then just look how zero, zero lift to his back, zero, right? So pretty cool. So, um, so then um, this is him um, the other day. I took your uh, giant, the, 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 the high physio pad. The, the three inch just, block, which we don't have in production at this point. It's not in production, but anyway, like this okay. is this really bad nerve pinched areas, really bad nerve pinching there. And you can see how he's sort of really having a lot of, a lot going on in his body, right? That's running all through his body, swishing his tail. And he's really, he's had a lot of practice with, with these pads. So he's, you know, working his integration, but you can see he's still super weak through his traps. Um, but he's not chomping on his lead shank and he right, is no, no. And he's like, he's, 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 he's just worked it. Right. So, so again, you know, that's just kind of, and that um, was so interesting. He put himself on the hard slant. I love it. <laughs> but that's the thing is that these are the kinds of things that the thing that's so notable about this is what you don't see anymore. You don't see him tightening his throat latch. You don't see him contracting his neck. You don't see him chewing on the lead shank. And so often we fail to see what's not happening anymore because it's gone. And you're like, oh yeah, I forgot he used to do that. Right? Yeah, well, it's like, so you typical. know, he's, he, this horse is, you know, he's still got, he's, he's still got a lot going on. I mean, as you can see, there's, he's hollow here, he's hollow here. I mean, he's, I'm getting him a new saddle. Like his saddles, saddle isn't bad, but it's not helping him clearly. Well, and as he changes, but the, yeah. just the whole neck release and the way it rippled through his body and then his, putting his back foot on the slant, it's, you know, you can right. totally see that he's working it for himself. Yes, yeah, and that's the thing is that they can actually, I mean, this horse has been, you know, inundated with pads, right? So he just picks his feet up when I give it to him, but he kind of, you know, recognizes them as like, you know, an opportunity to do some work now. And and so this is, what this is doing is this is really shoving that brachial plexus into dysfunction, right? It is making his brain pay attention to that area. It is saying, you know, and where that used to be very painful, you know, just aside, horses that won't stand on those things, it hurts too much. They can't go into that dysfunction. But now he's got enough give around the area that it's almost like hurts so good, right? You know, you go into the dysfunction, hurts so good, you do something with it. And, and so, you know, that's kind of his, you know, evolution, how I'm using the surefoot pads to kind of attack, you know, that nerve impingement and that thoracic sling. And then, um, you know, this is this is just um, him sort of before, this was after we had kind of a session and I got him, you know, like sort of understanding some of Celeste kind of like pillar work, you know, I've been sort of, you know, I didn't, I didn't really understand, um, you know, the, the way she was relaxing the muscles and, and interv you know, then firing them up. So we've been, you know, doing some of that and I've been teaching the horse that and so, He's actually started now to do some of the work on his own, you know, just out in the paddock. So that was really cool. Um, and you can see, you know, this is him, you know, in his normal brace mode, and this is him sort of working. And I think, um, you know, I think we're gonna, you know, this is gonna be a, a big, a big, a big step. So. But a difference in the shape of his neck. I mean, as you can see in the up above picture, just how much holding there is in his neck there, can't you? Right, right. I mean, every, this horse is, re, this horse's response to every single stimulus ever was that, you yeah. know, anything, anything, any, any question, the answer was brace, no, no matter what, With the bridle brace, this brace, the first year I had him, I had to take the bridle off for a year, you know, go, go near his head, you know, brace, anyway, you know, that, that's, um, Probably shouldn't have been riding him, but that's a whole nother story. Yeah, we live, we, we live, we live and learn. So, um, so anyway, uh, we have a meeting to get to, Wendy. Um, oh, <laughs> no rest for the weary here. So, okay, 
Um, I do have a question from somebody. So when doing yep. a walking exercise, do you have them rotate which foot is standing on the pad to give each foot a turn? Yes, yes. So it's one foot, one pad. You know, I start, you know, just like picking feet, right? So I just start with one foot, go to the next foot, go to the next foot, go to the next foot, not in any particular order. I don't walk them in any particular direction, but I think there's all, you know, there's all different ways of sort of, you know, being sensitive to this exercise and changing it a little bit, right? So, you know, what I tell my clients is to do each foot, but walk them in each direction, right? So do it eight times. So do the right front, walk to the right, do the left front, walk to the right, you know, do all four, walk to the right, then do all four, walk to the left, you know, just to, just to kind of, Maybe you we know, can really make a little worksheet for people. I'll see if I can get that done and make a little worksheet and then people can do that as a worksheet so that they can just mark that they, because what happens is you forget which way you went. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 um, but, but I do it, I do it before I ride. Um, I'll either, usually I do it before I tack up actually. Like I take my horse out of the stall and I do the little walking exercise and then I go in and groom him and tack him up. But I also think that, you know, you could do it like after you were tacked up, you know, before you got on, like if you were up in the ring, you could, you know, get on, like maybe tighten your girth a hole, you know, put them on a pad, walk a circle, tighten That's your girth That's actually a bit. for horses that are girthy, doing that, putting them on a pad and then be, yeah, gradually doing the girth and walking in between is like yeah. the perfect solution. Absolutely. Would be, would be amazing. And then the other thing that I tell my trainers is that like, I, you know, I just think that, you know, I can't believe everybody isn't doing this. It's so brilliant. But, um, you know, you're, you're at the beginning of your lesson and you've got, you know, your four students out walking on the rail and you're like, Susie, you know, you and Jeff come in and you put to put the horse on the pad and they stand on it. And then you're like, okay, out to the rail. And then the next one comes in and you give them a pad out to the rail. Next one comes in, give them a pad out to the rail, you know, and then you can just kind of muck around with that. You can, you know, stop in the middle of us and okay, you know, so and so is getting fussy with the bridle. Come on in, let's have him come in and stand on a pad for a minute. You know, I mean, like there's just to me, there's so many great little like exercises. And you know, you always want to be safe. I mean, there's a lot of stuff about being safe and offering the I'm not going into that in this lecture because it's been said enough, but you want to be safe with the pads and what you're doing and, and offer them to the horse. Um so uh and so anyway, you know, I think that the, so many people want to make this harder than it is. It really is quite right. simple. And I think that's the point. Yeah. And um, on my Facebook webinar? page, okay. Mary. Janet, to find the Slant webinar, go to the Sheriff Woody Klein YouTube channel and just search Rachel Bellini or go to number one. It is the first webinar. It was Janet. Oh, no, it's not the first one. That's not the first one. It's the second one. Oh, it's the second one. That's May 2020. Yeah. It's May 2020. I forgot the number. But Rachel's going to get a playlist now that she has three webinars. So she's going to have the Rachel Bellini playlist on the Sherwood Equine YouTube channel. So you can find oh. all the webinars. Really? Yeah. If you do three, you get a you get a playlist. Woohoo. Oh, I didn't know that. I would have done that so long ago. Uh, well, I tried to get you when you were like, <laughs> no, I'm busy. I was like, okay. But do go out to her Facebook page and do like Heart Equine. Um, she's been doing, Rachel's been doing fabulous posts about posture and other things, and it's really a wealth of information. So, and this exercise is, is all over my Facebook page. And Mary Elena Moran made a beautiful YouTube video where she explains everything like so nicely. I just am so grateful for, you know, I just love it when, when I see my work being presented so professionally. <laughs> it's awesome yep. so. so now you've got now you've got something you can set up your camera and remember you saw how rachel did it it's not difficult you can just set your camera there and do your little walking exercises post it up there in the fans of surefoot group we'd love to see it and hear how it's going for you all right yes. we've got to run because we got another one to go to so thanks everybody for joining us just remember to tell everyone they are all on the surefoot equine youtube channel our number one question is is it recorded Yes, they are all recorded. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Take care and thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Wendy. Bye.